So I was asked to um, give a very basic overview on ECMO. I have nothing to disclose, and this is my disclaimer. Um, I was recently at a course with the Society of Critical Care Medicine where I took, um, I took a course with ECMO for ECMO, and um, just wanted to share with you some of the things that I had learned there, so by no means do I claim to be an expert. Um, some of the things that we're going to be talking about today are modes, basic physiology, and anatomy of the machine itself. I'm going to very briefly touch on base, um, patient selection. Troubleshooting is where we'll spend most of our time, a little bit on weaning ethics, and the ELSO organization. So I'll talk about modes first. So the first thing is to know the definitions that are routinely used in the literature. Access cannula, now that's the blood, um, that's a cannula that drains blood from the patient into the ECMO circuit. By convention, that's the first letter. So when you see VA or VV, the first one is the access, so venous. Return cannula delivers the blood back to the patient, and it's by convention usually the second letter. Distal perfusion cannula delivers um, blood antegrade in the, into the femoral artery, distal to the ECMO return cannula. And basically, that's so you don't lose um, perfusion to the lower limbs if there's a cannula there. Um, there's a double lumen cannula. That's a single cannula that's partitioned into two lumens with both access um, to do access and return um, functions. VV, you guys all know about that now. Blood taken from large central veins to the oxygenator and returned to the cavoatrial um, area. The VA, blood from large central veins pumped through the oxygenator and returned to the systemic arterial system. So these are some of the ways where you can do it. This is the axis cannula. It's draining blood from the IVC. It's by convention denoted as blue, goes through the pump, and then is returned back into the superior vena cava. Similarly, here it's taken from the IVC, and it's drained back into the femoral artery after the oxygenator. So the differences is um, between VA ECMO and VV ECMO. Usually this is for adult cardiac failure, severe cardiac compromise. If you do not have cardiac um, compromise, you know, patients can do just fine with VV ECMO. So basically you'll see this for adult respiratory failure, um, but with the caveat that cardiac function is adequate. So a little bit about basic physiology. Oxygen content and oxygen delivery is going to be the most important measurement that we have for ECMO. The diffusion of gases in a membrane lung is based on partial pressures of the lungs, of the gases. So it's not very different from what happens um, with the native lungs. You have to remember that carbon dioxide transfers at six times the rate of um, oxygen, which you already know because of the solubility properties of carbon dioxide. ECMO is very good at ventilation. So just remember that. It's, a very, it's very efficient at ventilation. And you guys are already very familiar with the oxygen delivery formula. So these are the factors that are going to be in your control when you're, when you're managing ECMO, the cardiac output and the oxygen content. And how you're going to finagle the oxygen content is by hemoglobin oxygen saturation, and to, to a lot less degree than PaO2. So if you can remember that formula, ECMO becomes a little bit more understandable. So now let's just talk a little bit about the anatomy of the machine. So here you've got your ECMO um, console. This diamond shape that you see, that's the oxygenator itself. That's what's also known as the membrane lung. This is the centrifugal pump at Henry Ford. This is what you'll see. This is the type of pumps that we commonly use. Um, this is the heat exchanger or the warmer. Um, this is the oxygen blender, so this is where you're going to titrate your carbon dioxide, your FiO2, what have you. These are the axle access cannulae, so they're denoted with blue, blue markers right there, and the return cannulae with um, red markers. And you'll see that they're different lengths depending on whether they're going to be in the lung or, uh, sorry, whether they're going to be in um, femoral access or whether they're going to be up top in the neck. So again, this is kind of a brief um, diagram about how it typically flows. So if you've got an access cannula here in the IVC, 
um, through the femoral approach, it'll, the, the blood will be flowing from here to the pump, through the pump, through the oxygenator. Here you're titrating the gases, and from the oxygenator, it, oxygenated blood is going back into the SVC. So a little bit about the ECMO pump. Um, it increases cardiac output. That's what it's designed to do. It increases oxygen delivery. So if you go back to the formula, that's how you um, increase your oxygen delivery. So the speeds can go up to 4,000 RPM, 5,000 RPM, but that's really dependent on the kind of machine that you use. Usually you'll find that these machines can deliver flows up to 8 to 10 liters. Um, per minute, so it's kind of high. Centrifugal pumps are two pumps. Uh, centrifugal pumps are the ones that you'll see here. They're the ones that are now most commonly used. Um, the beauty of it is that they will not propel gross air into the patient. Um, they are preload and afterload dependent, so they work on a servo mechanism. Um, the pressures are, these pressures are important to know, especially the inlet pressure, so they shouldn't exceed greater than negative 100 to negative uh, 300 millimeters mercury because otherwise cavitation can occur and we'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, outlet pressures should also not be greater than 400 millimeters mercury uh, otherwise you can get a lot of heat development or hemolysis. So as I said there were two pumps um, before back in the day they used to do a lot of roller pumps which are now um, out of favor. What, they, what the roller pumps would do is that you had all this tubing and they would propel everything forward, but along with everything was air and um, pieces of plastic would kind of break off from the tubing and get propelled into the patient. And so a lot of people comment that maybe that's why the earlier studies weren't that successful because of all of this, but they could never measure it. They were so tiny, they just knew it was happening. So um, this has now gotten out of favor. Um, this is also not um, preload or afterload dependent. So if your patient was getting better, they were getting more hypertensive, they would be even more hypertensive. So if you weren't looking at the pump and you were looking at the patient, you know, you, you wouldn't be understanding what's happening with the blood pressure. You could easily overshoot. This is what your typical um, console would look like. So you've got your cardiac output, you've got the RPM, so this is the RPM that it takes, this is the speed it takes to generate this kind of cardiac output. Um, I know you can't probably see it very well, but this is pre-oxygenator, post-oxygenator, and this is your inlet pressure. Um, they do all have, um, the more recent machines and the ones at Ford do have um, detectors for bubbles, and usually that's macro bubbles, not micro bubbles, and the differentiation is that macro bubbles, you can actually see bubbles in the in the tubing itself. So obviously you don't want any kind of air bubbles going towards the patient. Circuit pressures, so three pressures really to, um, to know, and in inlet pressure is one of them. Um, again, it's pressure of the venous blood that's draining from the patient. This is via the inlet line, um, and the suction shouldn't be too much, and we'll go over why the suction shouldn't be too much a little bit later. Um, this is the ox the, so the oxygenator, the membrane lung. The total area is obviously much smaller than the native lung. There are two types, um, hollow fiber and then the hollow fiber microporous. Um, they actually, the newer oxygenators have a much longer life. So we're looking at probably about a 30-day longevity with them before you have to change them out, which is great because then, you know, it reduces the cost of the ECMO itself. All right. Um, the PA2 is sometimes um, set high on the sweep cast um, so that we can cause a larger driving force across the membrane. As the RBCs come into contact with the membrane, they'll become more saturated with oxygen. Just remember that blood flow is laminar, so the center of the blood is less saturated. You could increase the flow sometimes to improve your oxygen delivery, but it only helps to a certain extent. Um, oxygenation is dependent on the surface area, it's dependent on the blood path thickness, and uh, dependent on the membrane diffusion thickness. And I think this diagram just very easily tells you um, all of that in a nutshell. So if you've got blood that's coming in here, oxygen is being delivered in here, this is a cross section of what the membrane lung looks like from the inside. So if you increase your oxygen, your cardiac output, there's more blood that will be flowing through this path. 
So just know that diffusion actually com you know, happens here. Oxygenation happens here when it comes into contact with the membrane. But if so, the middle portion, if you've got a lot of blood that's flowing through at high speeds, it, the middle portion is not going to get oxygenated. You're really not going to get the, um, the benefit that you want, even though it would fit with the formula. So carbon dioxide exchange, this is also proportionate to the membrane surface area. It's dependent on sweep gas. It's dependent on gas diffusion gradient. It is independent of blood flow, and it diffuses a lot faster than oxygen um, due to the solubility. So you guys have probably heard on the floors where they're always talking about the sweep gas, right? So how you want to... Um, so if you want to decrease your carbon dioxide levels in the, in the patient, you increase your sweep gas flow rate. There's decreased carbon dioxide in the fresh gas. So when it, com it comes in contact with the blood that's coming in from the patient, obviously your PCO2 is going to drop very low. And because of the solubility index, you can go from, I'm sure you guys have already seen it, you go from a PCO2 of 90 to a PCO2 of 20. And those are the types of dips you really want to avoid. Mostly, PCO2 should not be decreased greater than at a rate of 20 millimeters per mercury over every few hours. So um, sometimes what winds up happening to reduce such dips, we actually add CO2 into the sweet gas so that the diffusion gradient isn't so large and that your drips don't go from 90 to 20, okay? So cannulae, so how do you pick the right cannula? Um, this is a science unto itself. If you go online, you'll probably see charts of what kind of flows you want, what kind of patient it is, and what kind of um, diameter, what kind of French um, cannula you should get. So generally, femoral cannulas you'll find are much longer. Single lumen um, cannulas are also available, double lumen cannulas. And this is the Avalon cannula, which is a form of a double lumen cannula. It is a single site um, cannula. We do have it at Henry Ford. I know um, the surgeons have used it. Um, it is single site. The most distal port is going to be in the in the IVC. Um, the second port will be in the RA and the, and the third will be in the SVC. So just to show you, um, this is from the company website of it going in. The Avalon catheter, so this is where the most distal port will be here. The SVC was there and into the right atrium and this is to reduce recirculation. This cannula is a weapon. It is very, very sharp. Sometimes it migrates into the hepatic IVC, and if it, if it migrates into the hepatic IVC, you can just imagine the, you know, the liver being such a vascular structure, it can actually do quite a bit of damage. So some people, some centers where they use the Avalon catheter, um, they will be ultrasounding the patients frequently to make sure that there hasn't been any migration. The second thing with the Avalon catheter is that it is very expensive to the point where um, I think it can average anywhere from $12,000 to $16,000 um, per cannula. So if you drop it on the floor, you just blew $16,000. Not only that, it's, it's so expensive and it adds to the cost of um, the ECMO programs that actually some centers have refused to use it until they lower the cost. So, um, Blood tubing, blood access sites, like I said, um, this is a science unto itself. The tubing length and diameter obviously will affect resistance, so if your tubing is too big, you're going to have low resistance. If it's too narrow, if it's too small, you're going to have a lot of pressure problems. Um, tubing size is chosen to allow free venous drainage. Um, number of access sites should be limited. Two access sites are usual, which are pre- and post-gas um, post oxygenate um, exchanger. Um, you can use the circuit for blood draws and effusions but you can similarly use a CVC as well. So at the time of cannulation, you know, if the patient doesn't have a central line and you don't want to mess with the circuit too much, ask them to put in a central line at the same time or right before cannulation. So patient selection, I know that Dr. Nemi in the fall already kind of talked to you guys about patient selection. Um, you all know the Murray score, the lung injury score. They must have failed conventional management reversible lung disease, viral bacterial pneumonias, Wegener's, asthma, usually within the seven, within seven days of ARDS onset. 
no compromised cardiac function, um, and MARI score greater than three. And when I say no compromised cardiac function, sometimes you'll find that patients are in pressors because of the lung injury itself, high intrathoracic pressures and what have you. And so that's okay. Those patients can still be tried on VV ECMO. But if you've got a primary cardiac disturbance, those are the patients that really should move to VA ECMO. And so again, the list for VA ECMO is a lot longer, so myocarditis, um, PE, um, cardiac trauma, anaphylaxis, all of these things. But just remember that you have to have a goal with ECMO. You have to have some picture in your mind where this patient is going to go afterwards. So either they're going to recover if they're flu patients, which is what we're commonly seeing, or they're going to get bridged to transplant. So if they're not a transplant candidate, they've got UIP, and nobody would have transplanted it anyway. You know, you, those are the patients that would not qualify for VV ECMO. So these are the two types of machines you'll commonly see at um, Henry Ford, the Centromag, which is the lower one. Um, you'll use, they'll use mainly for VA ECMO and then the Marquet Cardio Help, the top one, which is usually used for VV ECMO. The VV ECMO one, the Cardio Help, very portable. Um, and I think we have around two to three devices each. So we can wind up with five to six patients on some form of ECMO. Um, so I think this is where the troubleshooting um, issue kind of gets to us. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about that. So you're in clinic and you get a phone call um, saying that your patient was taken for VV ECMO. Now that the cannula are in, they're asking for ventilator settings. What do you do? I, this was really written for the faculty, so um, you know that you know the fellow that's going to make that call, right? So what are you going to do? What settings are you going to choose? So nobody knows which is better, but most of us will agree that at least start with six cc's per kg. Do ARDNET because what you're trying to do it, is reduce ventilator-associated um, lung injury. So um, many agree that PEEP is beneficial because you don't want too much atelectotrauma, right? So usually 8 to 15. You want to ensure that your plateau pressures are at least less than 30, and most would recommend less than 25. And you want to make sure that there's, they're not exposed to too much oxygen. So there's no oxygen toxicity. So the FiO2 would be less than 30%. That would be the goal. And your respiratory rate would you know, be somewhere close to 10 or 12. So a lot of people will term this at lung rest settings. Have you heard of that on P5 yet? Lung rest? You know, a lot of people will take this as a definition. This really isn't a definition as more as I'm beginning to think this is lingo. Because we don't know if um, ultra low tidal volumes are beneficial or not. But at least we'll all agree is manage the ARDS, reduce the morbidity of the ARDS as much as you can, because you're buying yourself time with the ECMO. There have been some articles saying, um, suggesting that three cc's per kg should be the starting point, which is fine. Most of these patients are going to be on much higher settings anyway, because if you're calling for ECMO, these guys are failing traditional you know, uh, mechanical ventilation, so you know they're um, plateau pressures are going to be high. You know that you know you're not going to be able to manage with three cc's per kg without removing, you know, without ECMO. So, at the end of the day, I think the take-home point, what I took away from this is, is that you want to reduce ventilator-associated lung injury. You want to do low tidal volumes. You want to do low plateau pressure. So, if your plateau pressure is 40, when you're doing 4 cc's per kg of tidal volume, you may want to reduce your tidal volume even further, try and recruit because PEEP is, um, is protective. So at the end of the day, just don't take home a number. You still have to manage the ventilator. Um, so avoid complete collapse. And some centers will actually allow a more generous PEEP level just in case the ECMO unit fails and the lungs are needed as a backup. But um, but do avoid complete um, apneic ventilation. Okay, so the ECMO initial setup. As if you didn't have enough add-on clinic patients, now they're calling from P5 asking if you're okay with the initial settings on VV ECMO. What should your initial settings be? 
So typically we'll take as initial settings, blood flow, blood flow rate should be around 60 to 80 cc's per kg per minute. The FiO2 on sweep gas could be started at 100%. Some centers will take 50%. I think if you just take 100% and then wean it down, titrate it down, it should be just fine. What you really want to keep an eye on, though, is your carbon dioxide levels. So here's your quick checklist. So what you want to set is going to be on VV ECMO, blood flow rate, the sweep gas, the hemoglobin, and the need for pressors. And on VA ECMO, again, the blood flow rate, the oxygenation, and the hemoglobin. So blood flow. So you increase the flow initially until maximum flow is possible. Then it's decreased to the lowest level. And the reason why you want to start high sometimes is to see what the circuit can actually handle. What kind of pressures will you get at maximal flow rate? So the pressures through the tubing. So that's what these algorithms will change from um, institution to institution, but I think this is probably the, in the ELSO guidelines that you'll find. Um, arterial saturations of 85% or more are just fine on VV ECMO. That is to be expected. Sats of 85, 83, 86, they're all okay on VV ECMO, and that's because of the recirculation phenomenon. Venous saturation, so an SVO2 of 65% or more at rest is just fine. On VA ECMO, your goals, oops, sorry. Your goals, once above, all of that is done. The pump flow is reduced until your pulse pressure is less than 10, is around 10 millimeters mercury. It shouldn't be less than 10 millimeters mercury. And this is done to ensure continuous blood flow through the heart and lungs during ECLS. Um, you want to regulate blood flow to meet requirements for mean arterial pressure. All right. So this is um, what I was saying about the pulse pressure. Just remember that ECMO is actually a form of cardiopulmonary bypass, but it is not absolute cardiopulmonary bypass. Um, it provides 60 to 80 percent of the resting cardiac output. The remainder, 20 percent of the cardiac output, is actually flowing through your lungs. Um, this is what happens in total cardiopulmonary bypass, right? Your pulse pressure does what? It narrows. And this is really where you want to be, somewhere here. So you'll watch your A-line. Have you guys seen this yet on your VA ECMO patients? No. Your, your pulse pressure will start to fall. But if it gets here, this is where you want to start calling your surgeons. Because why? You'll have no coronary artery perfusion left either. So just something to watch. And this is where maximal pulmonary flow will also happen. All right, so, rate it, so for oxygenation in the oxygenator, so that diamond-shaped device will come with a package insert. And on the package insert, you'll find the rated flow measurement. And this is the flow rate at which venous blood, venous blood will be fully saturated at the outlet when it comes out for a certain hemoglobin. So it'll say something like, if your patient has a hemoglobin of 12% with this cardiac output, expect the post-oxygenator PaO2 to be 350. And if it's not that, then you may want to consider that the oxygenator is faulty. So it should meet the package requirement, OK? Um, all right, gone over that. So this is the oxygenator. Um, blood flow obstruction can happen either at the um, inlet or at the outlet, which you can't see here. Um, usually it's thrombosis. Thrombosis at the inlet area would give high pre-oxygenator pressure. So out of the three pressures in ECMO, the inlet pressure, the pre-oxygenator pressure, and the post-oxygenator pressure are the pressures to monitor, to keep an eye on. So you can have thrombosis right before if your post-oxygenator um, pressures are high, it's probably indicating that you've got clots either anywhere pre, intra, or right before um, the port to check it. You also want to look for kinks at the end um, and things like that. So the normal delta P, so the pre-oxygenator minus the post-oxygenator pressure should be anywhere from 20 to 40. Anything that deviates from that, there's a problem in the circuit. You can also get VQ mismatch um, with the oxygenators as well. Sometimes the cold sweep gas mixes with the warm blood and it'll form condensation. Sometimes increasing the gas flow rate can help. Um, and sometimes the gas can actually be diverted to these little corners 
and you'll get VQ um, mismatched like that. So over here, this should actually say pre-membrane pressure monitor and post-membrane pressure monitor. These are where the monitors are um, measured. Okay, so saturation. So you've got inline saturations here. Um, hemoglobin, it'll monitor hemoglobin, hematocrit. Saturation of the circuit blood is also measured. Uh, measuring the saturation um, after the blood exits the oxygenator. Um, so things like that. So saturations can be monitored at a lot of areas. So that's one of the things when they call you from P5 and they give, they throw out a saturation, you really want to know where they're getting that saturation from. Where is the pulse ox? Is it on the foot? Okay. If it's on the foot, so where's the axis cannula? Where's the drainage cannula? It's very, you can't interpret saturations anymore unless you know where they're getting it. You can't interpret a PaO2 unless you know where they're getting it from. Okay, so um, just these random gases that can sometimes fly around. If you don't know where they took it, it's almost meaningless. Where did they take it? Well, it depends where you want it from. So you want a post-oxygenator gas. So when you see that 350 or 250, just make sure where is it coming from. So that's what I'm saying. Whenever, wherever you do get it from, just know where your cannulas are and how they got it. Well, the only judgment you can make on a post-oxygenator is whether the oxygenator is working or not. R ideally, you want to get it from away from the patient's cannula sites. So if the cannulas are, say, right groin and over here, you may want to get the, get the gas from the opposite arm to really know what the patient is doing. Okay, and I'm going to go through that a little bit more. Question on SVO to 65% more at rest. Uh, where do you get that gas from, that SVO2? Uh, so, somehow I am under the impression that uh, SVO2 and BP ECMO is very tricky because of uh, some factors of this iteration. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's, that's the biggest thing. And I'm going to go through some of those scenarios with you when it can be tricky. Exactly. Okay, so the next day you get a call from the nurse saying the saturations are rising. Why are you getting this call? And Rodeo, that's your, that's exactly what it is. So the saturations are rising. So your SVO2 is rising. So they're, and the patient's producing like they, so that's not good. That's not good. So your SVO2 is probably going up and your arterial saturation is going up. But you have to look, so don't take it as this patient's doing great. You really have to look at the rest of the patient. So now you've got a lactate that's four, a urine output that's decreasing, and the heart rate is up. So what just happened? So again, this is probably the best video I could find for recirculation. Um, but this is mixing of the deoxygenated blood with the oxygenated blood. And instead of the oxygenated blood flowing into the patient, it's now just mixing at the cavoatrial junctions. And that's why you're getting a higher saturation, because that sometimes is where you're going to be monitoring um, your inline saturation is going to be on the pump, on the pump itself. But if you get the peripheral, that would should be low, right? That will be low, because you're not circulating it. So again, it's very important to figure out where you're getting your saturations from and what kind of saturations it is. So again, yeah, it's an inline monitor to the so pump. Venus, and the side, Venus. Only Venus. Venus, yeah. Okay, so this is the access cannula, so that's the blood being taken away when it comes right back. Over here, the purple line is mixing, and there's some that's going in. So when this blood mixes, the more oxygenated blood, the higher your saturations work. So this is what they call recirculation. This is why the Avalon catheter is better, because the ports are so divided. And sometimes you'll have to figure out, are the axis cannula and the drainage cannula, are they too close together? Have the cannulas migrated? So those are all things that you have to look at when you get something like this. So you really have to reevaluate, reevaluate your chest X-ray, your abdominal X-ray, make sure the cannulas are still in position. Okay. And whenever you see this, 
you know, you really should um, let cardiothoracics know because you're not going to be manipulating the cannulas, right? All right, so you'll have to accept that some recirculation will happen. That's why we tolerate saturations of 85% arterial or 65 venous. You'll have to accept that. But as long as the patient is getting better, urine output's increasing, creatinine's going down, the patient looks a little bit better, you know, we'll tolerate it. Um, and sometimes actually decreasing the flow will also help recirculation. All right, so here's the next scenario. There's a patient on your service housed on P5 on VV ECMO for viral pneumonia. As you walk out, your residents comment on how active the tubing is. They ask you, is this due to the high flows in the cannula? You stare at the following as you ponder your response. Ew. So what's that? Chatter. It says it. So, so it's chatter, right? Um, where these cannulae are really moving quite a bit. It's not because of the flows, it's because of something else. Do you know what chatter is? It's uh, okay, so much suction. Right. And uh, it could be a volume problem or a suction problem. Basically, there's a pulsatility in the flow because a, a more proximal more proximal to the patient, the vein could be collapsing. Right. So it's usually um, some of the reasons for chatter could be due to low preload, um, could be due to the cannula that's right up against the cardiac muscle and suck. it's causing a suck effect, right? So it's like drinking a Capri Sun. When your kids are drinking and they put the straw all the way at the end and they're trying to get it out and the whole bag kind of comes in. So that's kind of how I think about it. Um, bleeding can also, but bleeding is also what? Hypovolemia. Um, too high a pump speed can also cause chatter. Um, and this is also known as cavitation. This is, a, it, this is problematic because it can lead to significant hemolysis. Um, what to do about it? The first thing that you ought to do about it is go down a little bit on the flow. Um, you could try to give fluids. If it continues, consider asking CTS whether cannulas need to be repositioned or not. Um, but this is also something that you should let them know about. If it doesn't, don't keep giving fluids. If after the first liter, it's not getting better, you want to let them know. Okay? All right. So the same patient continues to be on VV ECMO. Now the entire city's power outage has gone circa 2003. The backup generator is not working in your patient's room. What do you do? Yeah. That's your workout for the morning, right? So you maintain a constant speed. You hand crank it. All right. Um, don't forget to get x-rays. These, are prob this, these patients probably deserve daily chest x-rays. I know we're moving away from that. Um, I don't know if you can see, but this is the... Um, as the position of the SVC cannula, this is the position of the IVC cannula, so these, these two cannulae are in position, these two cannulae are out of position, um, right, I actually can't see it, it's actually down here somewhere, and that shouldn't be because it's a neck cannula, and then if you look at this one, this one's going all the way up to the clavicle somewhere, so these are totally out of position. All right, so you go back the next day to P5, and the nurse tells you the flows have dropped. Fluids have been given. Nobody has changed the RPM. You pull up the chest x-ray. What just happened? Anybody? So a pneumothorax can also do that. Um, there are a lot of reasons why the flows can drop, and... Um, you know, without anybody touching the RPM. And this is one of those reasons that, so get a stat chest x-ray whenever somebody tells you that, make sure there's no pneumothorax. If you guys know how to do chest tubes, please don't do chest tubes on these people. Just don't do it. They bleed like stink. Really, cardiothoracic should be managing them. If it's a small pneumo, manage conservatively. If it is a tension pneumo, get them involved, okay? Please don't go putting them yourselves. Would there be a change in the pressure monitor? You probably, depending on the size of the pneumo, exactly, there could be differences in in the pressures. Um, your third year, yeah, yeah. Do you know, are, are they calling us at this point because 
there seems to be a lot of like communication issues. So at what point are you going to know that this change has happened? No, the are nurses should call be calling you. Calling you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So they're, 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 they're sitting there monitoring it. I mean, they should be calling somebody, whether they call you or not, I don't know, but at least when I was doing it, this was something that would, um, Dr. Hurst would know. Hurst, Dr. Hurst would know. Yeah. And they were managing it. So somebody should get this call, but logistically, I'm not sure how it's been happening. The yeah. nurses have been instructed that whenever there are issues, the first the first phone call goes to the fellow, and then it just kind of escalates up the chain yeah. of command from there. And I think that's exactly the point to this, that at least you understand a little bit the terminology, some of the things when you know the flows graph. You know, before I didn't know what that meant. Flows graph, okay. Um, <laughs> But at least you'll get the initial workup going, get an x-ray, get a sense of what your inlet pressures are, get a sense of the pre and post ox oxygenator pressures, things like that. So at least you can have a conversation that's a little bit different with cardiothoracics than I think what we were having previously. Um, so, and again, I think this is also to avoid um, unnecessary uh, procedures being done on these patients as well, especially because of the bleeding risk. So your third year ER resident fellow ready to get the chest tube tray for you um, to staff, no problem. We've done many of these yet, yeah, just don't do it. <laughs> All right. The next day, you go back to P5 anticipating the next disaster. The team tells you that the patient was converted emergency, emergently to VA ECMO due to torsades, likely secondary to Seroquel Haldol combinations. Here are the vitals. So your heart rate's 178, your SpO2 is 87%, your blood pressure is very low, and you're afebrile. Your hemoglobin is 9 gram percent, white count is 22, platelets are 80,000, with a creat of 2.5, lactate is 2.5. What is going on and what will you do? The patient, by the way, is having multiple loose stools and so lost mag. What, what's going on with the patient? He's afebrile, but what just happened? The lactate went up, and the white count went up. What happened? And he's in acute renal failure. He's septic, right? So I was trying to go with the C. diff thing. Um, so the patient is septic. And so what do you do when a patient on VA ECMO is septic? So the patient, you assume, is rightly septic. They will never mount a fever. You have to understand that. that the temperature is actually regulated. And so sometimes patients will not mount a temperature. And the, this is important because when ID comes along and you've got a transplant patient, you have to really help guide them that, okay, temperature you may not find, especially on top of all those immunosuppressives and what have you. They may not have those swings, okay? So, and that may change what you do with your antibiotics, especially in the transplant patients. The lactate may or may not be elevated, but it's certainly very easy to miss um, sepsis on these patients. So make sure you give your fluids, antibiotics on the ECMO machine. Remember that sepsis is what? High cardiac output failure, right? They have high cardiac outputs. And sometimes what you'll notice is the patients start to get hypotensive. So what do you do on the machine? You'll have to slowly jack up the RPM, the speed, to do what? To increase the cardiac output, to meet their demands. The ECMO machines usually go from eight to 10 liters max. And so when you get these patients that are now floridly septic, you know, they can become very tricky to manage. There's no utility no, you can use pressors. You can absolutely use pressors. You can, because at that juncture, you've got nothing else left in your armamentarium. So if they respond, great. Um, so again, they just do very poorly. Yeah, so if you increase the flow, you'll have a better blood pressure to an extent. But if you can't control the sepsis, if you can't get source control, if you didn't get the right antibiotics, there's only so much time you've got.
Right, I know the pharma the pharmacokinetics of these drugs are, are a little bit deranged. Um, propofol can actually accumulate in in the oxygenator to lipophilic. Yeah, but what is there an issue with pressure? You know, we're still learning about the pharmacokinetics of these drugs, and and I don't know that it's been well established. I really do think that you instead of looking at the actual dose, you might want to say. You know, I'm just up going, I'm down going, I'm certainly going in the wrong direction. Okay. I don't know if that answered your question. But. Septic patients on VA at home, is the map go? Because they, as you crank up the flow, their pulse pressure narrows down. Do we still hit the, do we still aim for a goal of a map of 65 instead of 65? It depends on your patient. If they can tolerate a lower blood pressure, you think. You know, and their lactate is clearing and they're looking better and, you know, things are turning around. Sure. Go for the lowest effective um, because it settings. Because tricky because the blood pressure becomes tricky as you crank up the flow. Oh, yeah. Abs absolutely. And this is why they don't do well. So, which, by the way, somebody asked me if the cannulae can get infected and there's been no reports of the cannulae because there's such high flows of it getting infected. It's usually the associated pick line or the central line that causes it. So this same patient is now enuric. The patient is now grossly volume overloaded. Um, what do we do? So how do you do renal replacement, sorry, renal replacement therapy? So there are three ways to do it. Um, and I know when Dr. Um, Yasayan was here, he had his, his theories about it as well. So the three ways are you either put an inline hemofilter, which is the cheapest way to do it, the filter inlet is connected after the pump, and the outlet is reconnected to the ECMO circuit. Um, you can introduce the CRRT uh, circuit, and I can show you that in just a second. Or you can have just say, I'm not going to mess with the ECMO circuit. I'm going to put in my own dialysis catheter, and I'm going to have it completely segregated from the ECMO circuit. So that's a third way to do it. So, um, so usually, if you're dealing with a what you will find written, if you're dealing with a centrifugal pump, the CRRT device is connected after the centrifugal pump, not before. If you're dealing with the, um, with the older rotor pumps, it'll be connected before. Um, I know Dr. Yasayan had a little bit different theories because remember, this, the blood flow that's coming out of these pumps is enormous. They're like triple fold what you're going to get in the CRT circuit. So their CRT circuits are going to constantly alarm because they're never going to be able to handle flows like that. So he recommended actually, and I hope I'm not misquoting him, to put it before the centrifugal pump. But again, um, which way is best? How should we do it? There's really very little, little literature on that. At the Mayo Clinic, they'll just put an inline hemofilter. But even that doesn't solve the problem because the hemofilters can only take so much flow. So it's a little inconclusive. Hemoglobin. So the fellow calls you and asks if it is OK if he trans transfuses the ECMO patient. But he knows your RBC transfusion rates are being watched closely by Dr. Dejovni. The current hemoglobin is 9 gram percent. What is your response? Exactly. So the first question should be, what is the um, saturation? What is the arterial saturation? What is the um, venous saturation? And how is the patient doing? So if you don't have, if everything is OK, if the saturations are around 70%, if your SVO2 is around 70%, and your arterial saturation is around 80 85%, there's no reason to keep the hemoglobin higher. Okay, so that so a lot of people in the ECMO world are now moving towards a more restrictive um, blood transfusion policy. You will not see that though written about frequently. Most of the ELSO guidelines and the ELSO books will still say transfuse up to 14, 15 gram percent because it makes the formula work. But that's not necessarily true. So if the patient's doing okay, don't transfuse them. The SPO2 do we get it from the free oxygenator cannula? Right, so you can get it from the inline sat monitor, yeah. Anticoagulation, um, we all, I think, primarily use heparin here. Um, the ACT should be measured, um, point of care testing, 
I think about three times um, once every shift or so. The target is about 160 to 180 seconds. Uh, some centers are doing a gatraban and bivalirudin just because they don't want to deal with the question of hit. Um, but you should always watch out for hit. And the way you watch out for hit is just like any other ICU patient. You get your, you know, your pretest probability of hit, your hit score, and then you move on to testing. It shouldn't be any different. But while you're waiting for um, your platelet factor four and what have you, you want to switch the patient to a gatraban. Don't leave them on the heparin. Okay. Um, and of course, you always want to monitor for bleeding complications, and I think we've seen a few of these now. Um, all right, so the overnight resident tells you that the urine output is now T-color, the patient is tachycardic, and by the way, this is another patient, and the patient does not look good. The labs are as follows. Creatinine is three, hemoglobin went from 10 to seven gram percent, plasma-free hemoglobin is greater than 50 milligram percent, and the lactate is two. What just happened? So massive hemolysis, actually. So in ECMO patients, we actually don't routinely monitor haptoglobins because there will always, because the flows are so excessive in the tubing, there will always be some low-grade hemolysis. But that won't be clinically significant. But the haptoglobin, when you check it, will always be a little bit low. So A, it'll take for days for it to come back, and B, you're really not going to be able to interpret it. So what we check for is the plasma-free um, hemoglobin. So um, usually what you'll do is that if you get a high plasma-free hemoglobin, will repeat the test, and you have to draw it from the syringe. You have to draw it very carefully so that you don't lyse the RBCs in the syringe itself. And you want to reinspect the cir circuit and try and reduce the water bath, the temperature, um, to keep it a little bit cooler so that you know you mitigate some of the hemolysis until you figure it out. Okay, so Harlequin syndrome. Harlequin syndrome is also the same as North-South syndrome. Um, has anybody ever seen has seen this yet? No. Okay, so um, this usually only occurs in the VA uh, ECMO patients, um, and I think this video probably describes it best. So if you have a cannula in, um, in the femoral artery that's pointing towards the aorta, this is delivering oxygenated blood, now you have um, a stunned myocardium that is now regaining its function. The aortic valve is opening, but what's it doing? It's recovering, but it's taking, it's got deoxygenated blood from the pulmonary system and it's recirculating. Well, the aorta is connected to the great vessels that supply the head and neck. And this is what's known as the mixing cloud. So you've got oxygenated blood that is now competing with the LV, with the recovering LV. And as this gains more, this mixing cloud can actually go down. It'll start to move as the LV improves. But what happens is that this is all deoxygenated blood. And so the, your top body, the, the vessels that supply the top bar, body will be deoxygenated. So your patient is going to look blue from the top. But this is all the um, oxygenated blood, so everybody from diaphragm down is going to look pink. So if your pulse oximeter is on your toe and they're calling you, oh, the stats are fine, go home, you're great. Just be careful, okay? So you really want to know, you really need to evaluate these patients. So your pulse oximeter, if it's on the left toe, it's going to look 99%, you're going to look great. Put it on the hand and it's going to read something very different. Okay, so you want to you wanna be very careful with your saturations. So if the pulse ox, like I said, is on the toes, would the sats be high or low? They would be high. If the pulse ox is on the right hand, it would be low. Um, always, always, always ask where they're getting their gases and their sats from. Couldn't stress it enough. Okay, so weaning. Um, v VA ECMO, so you can use echocardiography to see if the heart is recovering. If it looks like the function is picking up now, you can reduce the flow by a liter per minute and keep assessing the hemodynamics, see if they're tolerating it. Um, VV ECMO, a lot of people will say don't even bother unless the aeration of the lungs looks a little bit better, um, but of course you'll see it on the ventilator if, um, 
if the volumes are improving and the compliance is getting better. And so you can stop the sweep gas, cap off the oxygenator, and then see how the patient does on the vent. Um, it's, this is called the Silly test. Silly was a fellow at the University of Michigan, um, and so his name is spelt differently in different textbooks, so I thought it was interesting. So his is increase the FiO2 to 100% on the ventilator. If the saturations remain 100%, then that's a positive test. Um, some people use a CPAP of 25 to wean. I don't know where they get it from. I don't know what the significance of that is, but you'll see it written, so I put it in there. But really, you can just use what we do traditionally. There's, no, um, there's nothing to say that you couldn't. Um, so that's very basic on the weaning. And then the ethics, this is something that I feel strongly about, um, and other centers have a more robust um, um, procedure around the ethics and end-of-life care on patients on ECMO. Um, I think palliative care should be involved early. I don't think you know they should be coming in when you've got that brain bleed. Um, so patients and their family members understand at what stage they're really at with this, with this ECMO. This is the ELSO registry, the extracorporeal life support um, organization. This carries the database for all registered ECMO centers. Um, I think some of, the, some of the concerns that I've heard is that there are a lot of centers that are doing ECMO that aren't registered, and so we're really not sharing data with each other, and it's difficult to assess outcomes um, when not everybody is, is participating. But as you can see, this is interesting, back in 1990, you know, these were the number of cases and these were the count, and look at us here, you know, 2015, it's been a tr significant jump, but the biggest jump might have been actually H1N1 um, in 2009. So the ECMO centers probably are more than what, what, um, what is actually noted here. So the registry includes data on patients undergoing ECLS. There's sel several aspects of the data is reported. Um, they're usually reported in two formats, the international summary and the center-specific report um, on each sub patient subgroup. So for us, if we don't have neonatal ECMO and we don't have pediatric ECMO, the only thing that we get reported out is our adult VV and adult um, VA. But children's would be um, pediatric VV, pediatric VA, neonatal VA, and neonatal VV, so, which is very rare. So um, all of that would be subclassified. And so that's about all I've got. Yeah. So uh, it was new to me that I know about the protocol that it's... Uh, There's just been a few case reports. Yeah. 